Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. From an apparent encounter with a reptilian entity to a possible case of alien abduction to regularly seeing ghostly manifestations and even shadow people, the experiences of Julie are indeed some of the most remarkable and thought-provoking on record. Just what happened to Julie and why over a two-decade time span remains unknown. Her encounters and experiences, though, may provide large missing pieces of the puzzle that will show what some researchers suggest is a clear connection between UFO and alien encounters and the paranormal. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… If you've listened to Weird Darkness for any length of time, you know that I'll often suggest someone who has had a paranormal disturbance in their home or life reach out to a pastor or priest for guidance. But what exactly happens when the Catholic Church starts investigating the paranormal? Many states around America say they have the most haunted road in the country. And while the words most haunted are somewhat subjective, it's hard not to see why people outside of Chicago consider Archer Avenue not only the top spooky street in America, but the most haunted on the planet. After allegedly murdering her husband in 1960, Sharon Kinney shot her lover's pregnant wife. Then she evaded justice and escaped to Mexico, only to kill again, before vanishing without a trace. Modern courtrooms aren't equipped or knowledgeable enough to determine whether or not ghosts are real, but that has not stopped ghosts from appearing in several court cases. When you hear of a two-headed creature, you typically think of two heads side by side growing from the neck and shoulders area. But have you ever heard of a creature growing another head on the very top of its other head? It happened, and not to just any creature. It was a human boy who lived much longer than anyone expected. Buried alive inside the castle walls, the Finnish maiden immured still haunts the medieval building of Olavinlina Castle. But first, the case of Julie from Carlisle in the United Kingdom is an intriguing one not only because it unfolded over many years, but because it appears to straddle the line between apparent reptilian entities and paranormal activity. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The case comes to us from the research files of Dave Hodrian of the Birmingham UFO Group. He saw a report from the witness on social media and contacted her in January 2022. He would interview at length over a period of several weeks. It would appear events began at some point in the year 2000, when Julie, not her real name, was only 12 years old. Julie was at home in her bedroom at around 9 p.m. 
As usual, she was reading a book, something she often did until quite late into the night, partly because she struggled to sleep and partly because she had a fear of the dark and would often leave the light on in her room. On this particular evening, as she was lying on her bed, she noticed a sudden movement at the bottom of the bed and instinctively peered over the top of her book. To her shock and horror, from the corner of the bed came a black, scaly arm with claws with white talons where the hands should have been. In fact, she noticed that there was no actual wrist between this claw and the arm, which was much more muscular than a human arm. She stared at the arm for a moment longer, contemplating whether she was imagining it. However, she knew that she wasn't, and she knew whatever it was, it was very real. What's more, although she didn't dare look, she had the impression that the creature the arm belonged to was at the foot of her bed. The arm continued to move across the bed, moving left to right. Then, right before her eyes, it simply vanished. She remained still, not daring to move in case the strange arm returned. After several moments, convinced it had indeed gone, she let out a breath of air. Although the arm had startled her, she was not frightened. In fact, she simply went back to reading her book as if nothing had happened. She estimated the entire episode had lasted no longer than seven seconds. In the days that followed, however, Julie began to sense an increasing feeling that there was a strange presence outside her room, a presence that could announce itself at any moment. This feeling became so strong that she even repositioned her bed so that she faced the door. Hudrian highlighted some intriguing details of the encounter. For example, after speaking to her at length about the encounter, it was his impression that she truly did see something and that it wasn't a case of her simply imagining it. As he points out, this was not a fleeting glimpse. She stared at the arm clearly for several seconds. He also highlights how the seemingly bizarre positioning of the reptilian matches other similar accounts. For example, some people who have reported similar encounters often state that these strange entities are often crouched or laid down, reaching upwards to the witness. They often, as Hodrian writes, position themselves in unusual ways. Even the color of the reptilians with black, scaly skin has been reported more than we might think. Just like in this case, although many reports state the skin to be green or a bizarre off-white color. There's also the possibility that Julie can't remember the entire incident. In fact, she may actually recall very little of it. In short, it is possible that what she recalled was the end of a reptilian abduction encounter. The fact that she was surprisingly calm despite the truly surreal nature of the incident perhaps also suggests this. What's more, many people who experience repeated abductions and strange encounters do so from an early age similar to Julie. Hodrian points out that the constant feeling that something was waiting outside her room about to enter may have been much more than a feeling. It could have been repressed memories of the encounter when the reptilian entity entered her room. Whatever the truth of the matter, this was just the first of many years of strange encounters and experiences. The following year, in 2001, Julie began experiencing many strange episodes that resonate with typically paranormal encounters, although there are also details that show up in cases of repeated alien abduction. For example, Julie began hearing strange footsteps in various parts of the house, even though there was clearly no one there. Doors would often open of their own accord, and she would often hear loud, clattering noises. On one occasion, while she was looking straight at it, a photo frame turned itself around as if being guided by an invisible hand. Many poltergeist cases have similar details. Even more alarming, she would often see shadowy figures out of the corner of her eye. However, by the time she turned around, there was nothing there. What's more, these shadowy figures often appeared to be extraordinarily tall, much like many reptilians are reported to be. The more time went on, the more other people would also witness these strange incidents. Furthermore, they appeared not to be limited to the house itself. On one occasion, when her mother, who worked at a nursing home, could not find childcare for Julie and her brother Steve, she was forced to take her children to work with her. 
she'd make a bed for them on the staff sofa and then go about her duties. However, in the middle of the night, Julia woke to the sound of her mother comforting her crying brother. When she asked what had happened, she was told that her brother had woken up to see the tube of a hoover that was in the room moving by itself. More than scared by what he was seeing, he screamed out for his mother. When she entered the room, she too saw the hoover tube moving. She walked over to it and pushed the hoover with her foot, at which point it lost its animation and the tube fell to the ground. Another bizarre incident around the same time had an unsettling connection to the nursing home. One of the residents, with who both Julie and her brother were familiar, Dorothy, had passed away. However, several days later, while on his way to use the bathroom, Steve claimed to have seen Dorothy sitting at their dining room table in the kitchen. Following this, Julie also began seeing strange moving entities in the kitchen, so much so that she became afraid to walk into the room or even past it. These were just several of the strange incidents witnessed by Julie and Steve. She would inform Hodrian of many more encounters. Julie would hand over a long text exchange between her and her brother regarding some of the incidents they experienced over the years of their childhood. He would recall that he used to see his late grandfather often in the house. Even more alarming, he would often see a large, shadowy creature. He couldn't recall precisely what it looked like, but he remembered that it was huge and wore a hat or a hood. He would also hear strange footsteps around the house particularly on the stairs, as if people were running up and down them. He even claimed to have seen the black, clawed arm that Julie had seen. Even more intriguing, Steve would recall an experience their father had that Julie had previously been unaware of. He recalled how he had awoken one morning to hear their father speaking to someone downstairs. After about ten minutes, when the conversation had ended, Steve decided to make his way downstairs. When he did so, his father looked at him strangely. He would ask his son why he was there, claiming he had only just had a 20-minute conversation with him. This is an interesting account, not least as many researchers suggest that reptilian creatures have the ability to shapeshift and essentially take on the form of other people. Had this been the case here, and might that same shapeshifting reptilian be responsible for the sightings of Dorothy and the children's grandfather? Steve would recall another bizarre and unsettling incident that occurred one evening while their father sat at the home computer and he was watching television from the sofa. He claimed that he at first believed their father was throwing items at him to annoy him and also started whispering his name. When Steve told him to stop it, their father had no idea what he was talking about. Steve didn't believe him at first. However, when their father suddenly turned white with fright, he realized he too had heard the strange voice. What is perhaps even more interesting, though, is that despite the strange events that happened outside of the home, the house itself would appear to be at least a partial key to unlocking the reason behind these strange events. Julie recalled that when she worked in one of the local pubs, she learned from someone who used to live there years before that his brother was one of the thalidomide babies and had sadly passed away in the house. What's more, there was always strange goings-on during their time living there. She also recalled another friend, Timothy, whose mother used to live in the property. She, too, experienced a string of bizarre activities and happenings. She, too, saw a strange, shadowy entity in the bedroom one evening. Whatever it was, she didn't dare get a clear look at it, but she knew it simply watched her for a considerable amount of time. Julie and Steve also recalled further strange incidents involving a family friend, Rob, who had recently died. In the weeks that followed, Julie began to have strange dreams of Rob walking into her room and sitting on her bed. The more she had these dreams, the more Julie began to contemplate if they were more than just dreams. She would ask Steve to sit in her room one evening while she slept to see if he too saw the ghostly form of their friend. Much to his amazement, he did, although he did not feel scared and just went back to the computer. Things would take an even stranger and more ominous turn for Julie in the summer of 2002. For reasons she couldn't explain, she suddenly began to have very unsettling but very real dreams. And what's more, 
they always involved two young girls. Often the girls would be in what appeared to be a warehouse, tied to a radiator. Other times, she would have horrific dreams where the girls were on fire. When she spoke to her mother about the dreams, she began to make a potential connection to the murder of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, who at the time were still missing. It's important to note that this is pure speculation on Julie's mother's part and that Julie was fully aware of the girl's disappearance at the time. Nevertheless, given the other strange goings-on, it is worth mentioning. By the time Julie was a young woman, she worked at a local hospital as a senior staff nurse, and the strange activity would follow her there one night in 2016. Julie would recall that one of the patients at the hospital had died that night. When family members who had been at the bedside had left at around 2 a.m., Julie and another nurse went about wrapping the body for a collection to the morgue. As they were doing so, Julie happened to glance up at the window. To her horror, in the reflection, she could see a tall, shadowy figure moving behind her from one side to the other. She further noticed a shuffling sound coming from the floor, as if something was physically moving. Instinctively, Julie moved back in shock. When she did so, the other nurse looked in her direction. The look on her face told Julie that she too could see the shadowy form. Both of them left what they were doing and ran out of the room. They remained in the corridor for around 15 minutes before returning to the room. Much to their relief, when they did so, the ghostly presence was gone. They cautiously finished preparing the body and left the room in order to fill out the necessary paperwork. When they went to do so, though, they realized that the form they needed had been left in the room with the deceased patient in their rush to get away. Julie returned to retrieve it. When she arrived in the room, she was stunned to find that the wrapping around the patient's body had been ripped away, leaving the dead man's head fully exposed. Although both nurses were beyond shocked and frightened by the events, they proceeded to re-wrap the body and then left the room. No further incidents occurred. At least, not that night. Much more recently, in 2021, Julie encountered another truly bizarre encounter while performing her duties at work. On this particular evening, at about 1 a.m., she was transferring a patient from one ward to another. As she was doing so, however, she suddenly noticed the shadowy form of a young woman that appeared to have blonde hair relative to her black form. This form was moving toward a sink in the room. To begin with, she thought it was a patient with a similar appearance who would often leave her bed at night. She turned around expecting to see her and to escort her back to the bed. However, to her utter shock, there was no one there. She spun her head back around and saw the faces of the other nurses. They, too, had clearly seen the shadowy figure as well. The nurses left the ward that they were on confused as to what they had just witnessed. Each of the other nurses recognized the similarity to the patient Julie initially thought that she'd seen. Realizing that it was impossible for the patient to have been there and disappeared, they began to contemplate whether the patient might have passed away and they had just witnessed her spirit. However, a quick check confirmed this not to have been the case. Just what it was the three nurses witnessed that evening remains unknown. Might this have been another case of whatever potential shape-shifting entity that has plagued Julie throughout her life taking the form of someone she would know? So just what did Julie, as well as her brother and several work colleagues, experience over a 20-year period? That they, particularly Julie, were at the center of something truly strange is without a doubt. Might it be that Julie herself is some kind of conduit, one that attracts these otherworldly entities to her and those around her? Might that be why other people sometimes witnessed these strange entities also? Many of the details of Julie's accounts appear very much like those of a typical poltergeist encounter. The appearance of shadowy figures, the strange banging, photos moving and other objects moving by themselves, as well as doors opening and closing of their own accord. Is this merely a straightforward poltergeist case? It would appear not. First, there were several encounters that took place outside of the family home, and while this is not unheard of in poltergeist cases, it is rare. 
Furthermore, many other families also experienced strange activity in the house. And again, while this does happen with cases of haunted houses, many poltergeist cases tend to revolve around one single person, admittedly often a child or a teenager. Or might many of these incidents be connected to alien abduction, much like the first one when she was a young child? It would be interesting to note whether or not there had been other occasions of missing time similar to the account of the reptilian arm. Or perhaps this reptilian abduction, if that was indeed what it was, was a one-off occurrence, but one that, intentionally or not, gave Julie the ability to see creatures and entities that most of us can't. Perhaps the house, for reasons unknown, might be the catalyst, almost as if it contains some kind of portal or gateway that allows this torrent of paranormal entities into our world. This might possibly explain the bizarre mixture of alien abduction and poltergeist activity. As always, the questions outnumber the answers. Whether these encounters continue, and whether Julie and those who might investigate them gain a better understanding of why they're happening, remains to be seen. When Weird Darkness Returns When the Catholic Church is requested to investigate a potential paranormal event, what happens? We'll see how the Vatican handles such things. But first, when you hear of a two-headed creature, you typically think of two heads side by side, growing from the neck. But have you ever heard of a creature growing another head on the very top of its other head? It happened, and not to just any creature. It was a human boy who lived much longer than anyone expected. That story is up next. A creature, part of the darkness before God created the heavens and earth, has awakened. It had slumbered, hibernating from the light. Now it's hungry and wanting to feed. Bobby, a local kid, and the police chief have gone missing. Everyone in the small town of Standard, Illinois, is turning to former Chicago cop Rob Aletto to find them. But as he starts his search, more people disappear. Rob is quickly overwhelmed. The night itself seems to come alive, taking these people. Aletto must find out why and discover a way to stop it before the entire town slips into darkness. Into Darkness by Jason R. Davis Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar The greatly anticipated sequel to Inside the Mirrors Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com In May 1783, in a small village named Mundulgat in Bengal, India, a strange child was born. The child had two heads. The midwife assisting the birth was so horrified by its appearance, she tried to kill the monstrosity by throwing it into the fire. Fortunately, the baby was rescued with some burns in one eye and ear. The parents, after recovering from the initial shock, began to see the newborn as a money-making opportunity and with that in mind, left their village for Calcutta, where their deformed baby could be exhibited. The two-headed baby attracted a great deal of attention and earned the family a fair amount of money. Between shows, to prevent the crowd from taking a peek without paying, his parents kept the unfortunate child hidden, usually under a sheet, sometimes for hours at a time. As his fame spread across India, several noblemen, civil servants, and city officials invited the child and his parents to their homes for private exhibitions, where their guests could examine the curious specimens up close. One of these observers was a Colonel Pierce, who described the encounter to the president of the Royal Society, Sir Joseph Banks, and it was Sir Banks who later forwarded the account to the surgeon Everard Home. 
by two-headed, some people might assume two heads growing side by side from a single neck. In this case, however, the boy's second head grew atop the other. It sat inverted on top of the main head and ended in a neck-like stump. The second head had a few irregularities, the ears were malformed, the tongue was small, and the lower jaw was rather small, but otherwise both heads were of the same size and were covered by black hair at their junction. The second head seemed to function independently of the main head. When the child cried or smiled, the features of the upper head were not always affected and did not match the emotion of the child. When the child slept, the second head might be awake and its eyes moving as if observing the surroundings. The second head reacted to external stimulus. A pinch in the cheek produced a grimace, and when it was given the breast, its lips attempted to suck. It also produced plenty of tears and saliva. However, the corneal reflexes were missing and the eyes reacted weakly to light. Despite his freakish appearance, the boy, or boys, did not seem to suffer any ill effects due to the condition. One day, when the child was four years old, his mother left him alone to fetch water. When she returned, she found the child dead by the bite of a cobra. Many anatomists offered to buy the corpse, but the religious parents could not allow such desecration. The child was buried near a Bupnorain River outside the city of Tumlok, but his grave was robbed by Mr. Dent, a salt agent for the East India Company. He dissected the putrefied body and gave the skull to a Captain Buchanan of the East Indian Company. The captain later brought the skull to England and gave it to his friend Everward Home. The skull of the boy of Bengal can still be seen at the Ontario Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons of London. When Mr. Dent dissected the heads, he discovered that the brains were separate and distinct. Each brain was firmly covered in its own duramater and was supplied by large vessels which delivered nutrition to the upper head. The boy's condition is today known as craniopagus parasiticus, an extremely rare type of parasitic twinning that occurs in about two to three in five million births. The embryo initially develops as twins, but it fails to completely separate, and one of the twins remains underdeveloped and attached to the developed one. Parasitic conjoined twins are very rare, and they're often stillborn or incapable of surviving after birth. The only viable treatment is to surgically remove the parasitic twin, but these kinds of surgeries are very risky. In 2004, Rebecca Martinez was born in the Dominican Republic with this rare condition. She underwent surgery at the age of eight weeks but died as a result of blood loss. In 2005, Manar Maged was also born with the same condition and underwent a successful 13-hour surgery in Egypt, but died several weeks later due to repeated infection. More recently, in 2021, a baby was born with two heads at the Elias Hospital in Bucharest, Romania, and also died some hours after it was born. You can see pencil drawings of this boy along with a black-and-white photo of his skull by searching for Bengal Boy at WeirdDarkness.com. The Catholic Church, in the eyes of some, is pretty bizarre, but messing around with the paranormal is something altogether different. For the Vatican, paranormal investigations are treated with the utmost sincerity and urgency, whether personnel are deciding on whether to put their God-plated seal of approval on Vatican-certified miracles in order to canonize a saint, or carefully dispelling a wayward demon who set up shop in someone's body. Everyone who has not seen The Exorcist or The Conjuring has definitely seen some kind of film that follows demonic possession tropes. What if you found out some of those stories were real? The Vatican deals with thousands of paranormal cases a year, and some of those cases include legitimizing recent miracles in the Catholic Church or performing a full-fledged exorcism. Most Vatican paranormal investigations involve working with a team of doctors to determine whether paranormal phenomena has occurred at all. So how does the Vatican investigate miracles, possessions, and other paranormal activity? Special committees and a ton of training. Here's what goes down when the church gets wrapped up in the paranormal. 
The Vatican has an office called the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, responsible for investigating paranormal activity, that is, miracles, involved in an application for sainthood. If proof of a miracle exists, the person who performed the miracle may get beatified. This is one of the first steps of becoming a saint, and it's necessary for a miracle to be officially recognized by the church. Each case investigated by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints is opened by the bishop of the diocese where the individual under investigation died. Typically, bishops must wait at least five years before opening a case, though the Vatican can make allowances in exceptional cases, as what happened with Mother Teresa. Pope John Paul II permitted investigation into her miracles to begin two years after her death. The path to the verification of a miracle isn't easy. The Congregation for the Causes of Saints evaluates whether the person who allegedly performed the miracle is virtuous enough to have performed a miracle before deciding whether a miracle even happened. Significant evidence that the individual in question was exceedingly holy and people had been drawn to prayer through his or her example must be present. If the congregation rules that a person was indeed a servant of God, the case is then passed to the Pope, who can beatify candidates for sainthood. It takes a bit more than a great moral compass to prove someone performed a miracle, though. For a miracle to be seriously considered by the church, it must meet certain requirements. Miracles, such as the miraculous curing of a disease, must be instantaneous or sudden, complete and permanent and without scientific explanation. For example, you can't have miraculously cured cancer with a flick of the wrist and some good prayers for it to come back five years later. All of these qualifications must be proven and the burden of finding proof falls on a team dedicated to research. With medical miracles, after the Congregation for the Causes of Saints rules a person is virtuous enough to have performed a miracle, the case is then turned over to the Consulta Medica, a board established by the Vatican in the mid-1900s and made up of a hundred renowned Italian Catholic physicians. A panel of five Consulta Medica doctors review the miracle, examining things such as CT scans, X-rays, and medical reports. If three out of the five agree the act in question was not performed by science, but rather the hand of God, it's then passed on to a panel of priests and cardinals. The vast majority of modern miracles are medical. According to NPR, more than 95% of the cases cited in support of a canonization, however, involve healing from disease. Michael O'Neill, the owner of MiracleHunter.com, estimates an even higher percentage than NPR. He said in an interview with Live Science, 99.9% .9 of the miracles investigated by the Vatican are medical miracles. They need to be spontaneous, instantaneous, and complete healing. Doctors have to say, we don't have any natural explanation of what happened. Because of this, the Consulta Medica is involved in nearly all miracle investigations. For cases in which a reported medical miracle happened because someone prayed to a saintly candidate after his or her death, the prayers are investigated. If Consulta Medica cannot produce a scientific explanation for the alleged miracle, doctors pass the case to a panel of cardinals and priests who look for evidence of healing prayer. If healing prayer occurred, the panel issues a declaration. Miraculous healing in response to prayer is seen as proof the potential saint in question is in heaven with God. The Pope can beatify the applicant if he chooses, and that is the final step before canonization, being officially declared a saint. Sainthood applicants usually need two verified miracles to be canonized, unless the individual in question was a martyr. In the case of martyrdom, the Pope might simply just declare sainthood. In order to understand how the Vatican investigates and handles exorcism, it's important to know that there are two kinds of exorcisms, minor and major. Minor exorcisms don't have anything to do with demonic possession. Major exorcisms are what movies have trained the public to think of upon hearing the word. This might come as a shock to Catholics who only half paid attention in Sunday school. You were exorcised if you were baptized. Baptism exorcisms are minor exorcisms, and they focus on protection, not possession. Sorry, nothing paranormal here. The reasoning behind baptismal exorcism can be found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Quote, 
Since baptism signifies liberation from sin and from its instigator the devil, one or more exorcisms are pronounced over the baptismal candidate." Unquote. According to Father Lampert, an experienced exorcist who spoke to Catholic.org, true demonic possession is exceedingly rare. Only one in 5,000 cases is ruled full demonic possession. Mild encounters with paranormal entities are far more common. A demonic attachment, for instance, happens when a demon attaches itself to someone but doesn't take full possession. This can go unnoticed because the person to whom the demon attaches only feels symptoms like sickness when near a holy place. There's no speaking in tongues. Demonic oppression is what it's called, and the influence of a demon causes the afflicted to feel depressed or drained of energy but is not mentally depressed. The Vatican is just as strict about verifying demonic possession as it is about miracles. Every candidate for exorcism is thoroughly researched to prove the existence of demonic possession. In 1999, the Vatican revised its guidelines for determining whether a person is demonically possessed or mentally ill. Now, priests are required to consult mental health professionals before performing exorcisms. If doctors rule out mental illness in cases of potential possession, priests look for specific symptoms of demonic possession before performing an exorcism. The symptoms include speaking in foreign tongues previously unknown to purported victim of possession and superhuman strength. Speaking in foreign tongues can sometimes be attributed to foreign accent syndrome, though it is an incredibly rare condition. According to the Catholic Church, those who are demonically possessed might also have knowledge of things that they shouldn't know, such as personal information about priests or professionals looking into their possession, people they've never met before. According to Father Cipriano de Mayo, a priest who has been an exorcist since 1952, most people who believe they are possessed are struggling with a completely different phenomenon. Truly possessed individuals can be separated from the pack by their response to prolonged prayer sessions. A possessed person, he says, has various general attitudes towards an exorcist, who is seen by the adversary as an enemy ready to fight him. There's no lack of frightening facial expressions, threatening words or gestures and other things, but especially blasphemies against God and Our Lady." Unquote. Only the bishop of the diocese in which demonic possession takes place can grant a priest permission to perform an exorcism. The bishop examines the medical information provided, along with the symptoms of the afflicted. If the bishop believes the person is truly possessed rather than mentally ill, he'll grant permission to a priest to perform an exorcism. A bishop can only appoint a priest who is specifically known for his holiness, that is, he has to be holier and wiser than a regular priest. Some training doesn't hurt either. The Vatican requires exorcists to be highly trained, because demonic possession is easy to fake and hard to ascertain as true. Certain priests have exploited alleged victims of possession. In other cases, unrecognized mental illnesses were mistaken for demonic possession, exacerbating the problem by keeping the victim away from actual true medical assistance. Priests who become exorcists go through an apprentice-like process, by which they work under an experienced exorcist. These experienced exorcists are granted permission to teach by bishops. Yeah, there's such a thing as an exorcism workshop. Some time back, I recorded an episode of The Church of the Undead, my other podcast, which covered demons and how to protect yourselves from them. You can find it at WeirdDarkness.com by searching for The Dangers of Demons. Coming up, many states around America say that they have the most haunted road in the country. And while the words most haunted are somewhat subjective, it's hard not to see why people outside Chicago consider Archer Avenue not only the top spooky street in America, but the most haunted on the planet. And buried alive inside the castle walls, the Finnish maiden immured still haunts the medieval building of Olivenlina Castle. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns.
Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. murder, beheadings, mad monks, and communion with the deceased. While this might sound like a Satanist's calendar appointments, it's actually just some of what lurks on the most haunted road in America. It's not often that I personally find myself in the spooky locations I tell you about here in the podcast, but on June 26, 2022, I in a way accidentally discovered I was on haunted ground. It was a Saturday and I had my weird darkness table of freebies at the Chicago Paracon in Summit, Illinois. The address where the con was being held was a building on Archer Road. For some reason, I never put two and two together that I was representing a spooky podcast directly on a spooky road, until after the event was over, when somebody just casually mentioned in some other conversation that Resurrection Cemetery was less than a quarter mile up the road from where we were. I interrupted their conversation and said, wait, did, did you say Resurrection Cemetery? THE Resurrection Cemetery? They looked at me in shock for not knowing where I was. And once I realized where I was, I was in shock as well. The moment the Chicago Paracon concluded, I jumped into my car and took a quick daytime tour through the historic and haunted cemetery, and I filmed it. It is a beautiful cemetery when it's light outside but I can certainly see how it might turn spooky once the sun disappears and the night takes over. If you want to see my short video tour of Resurrection Cemetery from the dashboard of my car, you can visit WeirdDarkness.com and search for Resurrection Cemetery. Originally an old Native American trail, Chicago's Archer Avenue is considered one of the most powerful spirit lines on the planet. A stretch of Archer Avenue is saturated in paranormal occurrences that have terrified many and spawned tales passed among Chicago residents for decades. Tales that include vanishing hitchhikers, black magic rituals, and blood-drenched ghouls. Some attribute the intense energy connected to the street with the surrounding bodies of water, some with Native American remains found along the route. Regardless of what lures such darkness to the area, time has proven the creepiest stories from Archer Avenue endure. The real question is whether this haunted trail will continue to produce further horrors. The most famous ghost in Chicago is Resurrection Mary. This ethereal specter has haunted the strip of Archer Avenue between Resurrection Cemetery and the Willowbrook Ballroom, formerly the O'Henry Ballroom, since the 1930s. No one's quite sure of the young lady's identity, but a widely accepted origin story conjects that Mary, after dancing the night away, left the ballroom in a huff after a fight with her date. Tired and angry, Mary might have been struck by a vehicle while walking down the pitch-black wooded stretch of Archer Avenue. What makes Mary unique from other hitchhiker tales is that witnesses claim, when offered a ride, she accepts and then directs the drivers up Archer Avenue in their car, only to disappear when the car reaches Resurrection Cemetery. Mary appears as a young, pale, blonde woman dressed in a white party dress and further witnesses claim to have seen Mary roaming around Resurrection Cemetery at night. On August 10, 1976, a passerby noticed a girl grasping the bars of the cemetery and, fearing that she was locked in, alerted the Justice Illinois police. When the police arrived, 
They combed the cemetery but found no one. They did, however, find that the rails of the fence bent at sharp angles with two blackened scorch marks indicating where they had been pulled apart. The marks were in the shape of handprints and appeared to have the texture of human skin. Monk's Castle acquired its local moniker after numerous sightings of phantom monks in the woods dressed in brown robes, carrying lanterns and chanting in Latin. The site's actually named St. James of the Sag Church, and it's most notorious for rumors that a group of rambunctious teens were once caught there by evil monks who tormented them in hideous ways. These monks supposedly haunt the church and its cemetery. Legend has it they will go after teenaged trespassers. Along Archer Avenue in the Bridgeport section of Chicago lies the infamous Kaiser Hall. Back in its heyday, Kaiser Hall was a popular ballroom that not only catered to the immigrants of the neighborhood, but supposedly to the devil himself. According to legend, a young woman was swept off her feet by a handsome, dashing man at one of the hall's dances. After hours of dancing with the young man, the woman happened to look down at her partner's feet and screamed at what she saw. Men in the vicinity assumed the man had made an unwelcome advance on the woman and chased him up to the second floor of the Kaiser. Once cornered, the man jumped out of the second-story window, landed with ease on the ground, and walked away. The stranger got away, but in the cement where he landed was the imprint of cloven hooves. Right across from Resurrection Mary's infamous ballroom, O'Henry's, is a restaurant said to have been one of Al Capone's speakeasies during his reign. Known as O'Henry's Roadhouse, it served as an alcohol-fueled gambling den and brothel, with a basement used for interrogations and the slaughter of Capone's enemies. The walls contained hidden compartments to hide gangsters, and there were underground tunnels for escape routes. While the building itself showcases shadowy specters and strange noises, the most jarring manifestation reported is the pulverized face of a sex worker that is sometimes seen in a bathroom mirror. This same woman once appeared in front of the building's owner and informed him of how much she appreciated the renovations that were taking place. Sightings surrounding the establishment include men fleeing through the woods, corpses being carried off, and the sounds of gunshots and screams. Some visitors claim to feel as though they are being intently watched by something just beyond the trees. One of Archer Avenue's most infamous stories is that of a phantom, driverless, horse-drawn hearse that tears up and down the road and through the cemetery. Built of black oak and glass, horrified witnesses have seen the coffin of a child inside the hearse. The origins of the crazed courier are hotly contested. Some believe it's either the hearse that Resurrection Mary's parents used to transport her coffin or a carriage described in an 1897 sighting reported to have occurred at St. James of the Sag. Wherever it hails from, or why it haunts Archer Avenue, the hearse is the most energetic of spirits seen on the road, pulled with fervor by its devil-spooked horses. Maple Lake is located in what's considered the Archer Avenue Triangle, a section around the main thoroughfare that bursts with excess paranormal energy. The area has been frequented by cults, been the site of black magic rituals, and a teenage girl's body was once discovered there. However, the lake's main claim to fame is the bright red ghost light that moves slowly along the edge of the northern shore. The source of this orb has no definitive explanation, but stories abound as to its possible origin. Some claim it's the lantern of an early settler slain by Native Americans who now searches the shoreline for his lost head. Others claim the opposite. It's the ghost of a beheaded Native American also looking for his head. Due to the prevalent crime in the area in the 1920s, some believe it's the specter of one of Al Capone's victims looking for his head. Redgate Woods is a forest preserve along Archer Avenue that served as home to the world's first nuclear reactor burial site back in the years of the Manhattan Project. About a half mile away from the project site, is an area known for equally dark reasons. For many years, people have claimed that these woods play host to a satanic cult that performs dark rites and chases off anyone who dares approach their ritual clearing. Hikers tell tales of finding strange red symbols painted on trees and an altar of logs and stone. 
Chicago forest preserves that are close to cemeteries have often been thought to be a lure for demonic cults, and local radio shows have sent willing participants into the woods on Halloween night to antagonize Satan worshippers. Common advice passed on to those who may stumble across a demonic ceremony in the Red Gate Woods was, if pursued, to run in a zigzag pattern to avoid the pits cultists dug near trails in order to trap trespassers. Bethania Cemetery, a predominantly German burial ground in the Chicago suburbs, is plagued by two distinct specters. During the autumn months, late at night, motorists have spotted an elderly man in a red flannel shirt walking the grounds. He appears with rake in hand, burning a large pile of leaves near a maintenance entrance. Although he wears a friendly smile, passersby can't help but slow down to gawk at anybody doing yard work between 2 and 4 in the morning. Upon closer inspection, the man always disappears. Another of Archer Avenue's most ghoulish phantoms frequents this cemetery. A man completely covered in blood has been witnessed leaping onto the roadway while frantically waving a flashlight as though flagging down help. Cars that stop to assist report the man returns back down the embankment toward the cemetery fence before vanishing. One driver said that he was driven off the road by the blood-soaked ghost when blinded by his flashlight. The eeriness of Fairmont Willow Hills Memorial Park comes not only from the rumors of spirits roaming among the tombs, but also from the oppressive clock tower situated on a hill near the entrance. Shadowy figures are seen sloping across the park's hills, one of which may be the ghost of a woman who was found slain on the cemetery grounds. A phantom face has also been seen peering from behind a window in the clock tower. More infamous is the bizarre harpsichord music heard bleeding out the park's white mausoleum. Most often heard at dusk, the music is especially baffling considering the interior of the white mausoleum is completely filled in with concrete. And the Why Not Drive-In? It's not remembered most for its decades of serving up fast food and post-war era hospitality, but rather for dishing out a heaping side of amour fatal. On foggy nights, a ghost named Debbie is said to park her 1965 Ford Fairlane in the lot of this greasy spoon. She waits for an interested young man to pull up next to her and tells him that if he'll follow her, she'll escort him out of town that evening. The unsuspecting gentleman is led on a dangerous chase through thick fog, trying in vain to keep up with red taillights that are always just beyond reach. To date, it's not known if anybody has ever caught up with Debbie or what that might have cost them if they did. Olivenlina Castle was built in the northernmost place in the world in the 15th century. In the heart of the Finnish lake region of the southeast, it used to be on the front line of the unstable border of Sweden and Russia. The Olivenlina Castle is built on a small island overlooking the dark waters surrounding it. Since it was built in 1475, the Olivenlina Castle was in the front line of the territorial dispute between Sweden and Russia as Finland for many years was fought over. It was placed strategically to protect the important Savo region and saw many sieges, battles, and wars over the years. It held up the defenses for a long time, all up until 1714 when the Russians took over the castle and held it until 1917. A castle designed for war, it was named after Saint Olaf, the Norwegian king and saint for all knights, and throughout the years the castle saw enough bloodshed and death for eternity. A poem written by Robert Southey is said to have been inspired by Olivenlina, titled Donica. It reads, High on a rock, whose castled shade darkened the lake below, in ancient strength majestic stood the towers of Arlenko. The stories of the castle are plentiful, with legends of Finnish water spirits living in the black water surrounding the castle. Although not malicious by nature, they are said to be dangerous as they reportedly drown people simply because they get bored. 
There are also tales of the ghost of a black ram that escaped being dinner at a feast roaming the castle. But most famously, there is the story of the Finnish maiden that was immured inside the Olavinlina castle walls. The Finnish maiden is not only a local legend from the castle alone, the image of the Finnish maiden is also used as a personification of the country itself. Often depicted or seen as a barefoot young woman in her mid-twenties with braided blonde hair, blue eyes and wearing a white or blue outfit, and in paintings she is either depicted as victorious with her fist raised or, as in one painting named Attack, she's dive-bombed by a Russian two-headed eagle, meant to represent Finland. The most famous story about the Olavinlina castle is the tragic story about the Finnish maiden that is said to be buried inside the castle walls. She was, according to legend, the daughter of the lord of the castle at a time when the threat from Russia was ever-present and the castle was at the line of defense from the Russian forces. Amidst all of this, she had fallen in love with a Russian soldier and trusted that he would do her no harm. But she should never have trusted so easily, as she was soon betrayed. When opening the castle gate for her lover, he brought more soldiers in with him to attack the castle from the inside. They managed to beat the Russian soldiers, and the treacherous lover was killed in the attack. But the tragedy didn't end there. The maiden herself was also punished for her foolishness. She was condemned to death for treason and buried alive in a wall in the courtyard. Immurement, which is live entombment, was a form of capital punishment, especially in legends and folklore. When used as a method of execution, the condemned dies from starvation or dehydration, and it's often a slow and excruciating demise. Soon after, a rowan tree is said to have sprung up in the yard with white flowers blooming from the branches, a symbol of the maiden's innocence. The tree also had red berries growing from it, as red as her blood. There is no longer a rowan tree in the Olivenlina courtyard, and its historical existence has no way been proven neither is the story. What is true, though, is the story of the maiden is now so deeply ingrained in the local folklore and the Olivenlina Castle legend, it might as well be true, because that's the way people want it. When Weird Darkness Returns, modern courtrooms aren't equipped or knowledgeable enough to determine whether or not ghosts are real. But that has not stopped ghosts from appearing in several court cases. But first up, after allegedly murdering her husband in 1960, Sharon Kinney shot her lover's pregnant wife. Then she evaded justice and escaped to Mexico, only to kill again, before vanishing without a trace. That story is up next. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. In 1960, Sharon Kinney was living as a bored housewife in the small Missouri town in which she was born. A mother to two and married to a Mormon man six years her senior, 
Kinney occupied her time with shopping and extramarital affairs. Both she and her husband James were looking for a way out of the marriage when Kinney reportedly found him dead by an apparent gunshot wound to the head in March of that year. She told police that their two-year-old had shot him accidentally, but then her lover's pregnant wife turned up dead months later. Though she was acquitted for both murders three times, Kinney would kill again after running away to Mexico in 1964. But just five years later, Kinney managed to escape the Mexican prison where she was being held and hasn't been seen since. As of this podcast, Sharon Kinney is considered one of the longest missing felons in United States history. Born Sharon Elizabeth Hall on November 30, 1939 in Independence, Missouri, by 16 Kinney was ready to escape her small town. She thought she found an opportunity in 22-year-old James Kinney, a student from Brigham Young University. After becoming pregnant with his child, Sharon and James Kinney married, with Sharon converting to Mormonism and giving birth to their daughter in 1957. Bored in suburbia, a now 20-year-old Sharon burned through cash with a shopping habit. As James Kinney worked night shifts as an electrical engineer, she reacquainted herself with her high school friend John Bolditz. By March 1960, facing debt and suspecting his wife's infidelities, James wanted a divorce, but his devout Mormon family urged him to try it one more day, according to the La Crosse Tribune. Sharon Kinney was also contemplating separation, but of a vastly different kind. On March 19, 1960, Kinney called the police after reportedly finding her husband dead. She claimed that she was in the bathroom around 5.30 p.m. when she heard a gunshot from the couple's bedroom. James Kinney was napping, so she was shocked to find him shot in the back of the head with a 22 caliber pistol held by their two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. Kinney told officers that her husband often let their daughter play with his guns, a fact confirmed by friends and family. No gunshot residue tests were completed on Kinney or her daughter and investigators ultimately decided that Kinney's story could have been true. Sharon Kinney received her husband's life insurance policy of $230,000. And that could have been the end of the story, if not for the death of her lover's pregnant wife. Using some of her new money, Kinney bought a Ford Thunderbird from a married car salesman named Walter Jones on April 18, 1960. They started a brief affair that Jones ended when Kinney announced that she was pregnant. Then, Jones' pregnant wife Patricia went missing on May 26. After filing a missing persons report, Jones eventually learned that the previous afternoon, Patricia had been dropped off to meet with an unknown woman. The woman was seen waiting in a car wearing a headscarf and large sunglasses. Jones angrily confronted Kinney, who admitted to calling and meeting Patricia. Kinney and her ex-lover John Bolditz led police to Patricia Jones's body off the path of their usual lover's lane. Jones had been killed by four shots to her head, stomach, and shoulders by a 22 caliber pistol, her time of death estimated to be early the previous evening. The police, having found only one 22 bullet at the scene, had three most likely suspects – Kinney, Jones, and Bolditz. Jones and Bolditz gave written statements that they had dated Kinney and passed polygraph tests. Investigators knew Sharon Kinney was the last person to see Patricia Jones alive, and so, on May 31st, Kinney was arrested for her murder. At that time, police also charged her with the murder of her husband. But Kinney's separate trials were postponed as she gave birth to another daughter on January 16, 1961. The Patricia Jones trial began with the absence of a murder weapon though a man who worked with Kinney admitted to purchasing a 22 caliber pistol for her in early May 1960. But when police searched her house, they only found an empty gun box. In June 1961, citing just too many loopholes, the all-male jury acquitted Kinney. Afterward, a jury member requested Kinney's autograph, which she duly signed, captured by a Kansas City Star photographer. For the murder of her husband, Kinney was found guilty at trial and sentenced to life on January 11, 1962. According to court documents, prosecution witness John Bolditz testified that weeks before the murder, Kinney asked him, would you kill my husband for $1,000, which Bolditz thought was in a joking way. In March 1963, a Supreme Court reversed Kinney's conviction, 
ordering a new trial, which ended in a mistrial and her third trial resulted in a hung jury. Out on $25,000 bond, Kinney headed to Mexico City in September 1964, entering under a false name. While Kinney could legally travel, she did not have written permission from the bail bond company to leave the U.S., making her a wanted felon. On September 18, 1964, Sharon Kinney entered the bar of Del Prado Hotel, meeting Mexican-born American citizen Francisco Perales Ordonez and ended up in his motel room, ostensibly to look at some pictures. Kinney spurned Ordonez's advances and shot him twice in the chest just to scare him off. A motel employee hearing gunshots was shot and injured by Kinney as he entered the room. Kinney was locked inside and then arrested, claiming self-defense. The Mexican police thought otherwise, and that it was instead a robbery gone wrong. During questioning, Kinney allegedly told a U.S. Embassy official that she had shot men before and gotten away with it. A search of Kinney's hotel room revealed the 22 caliber pistol that likely killed Patricia Jones. Although ballistics testing matched that of her 1961 trial, Sharon Kinney could not be charged for Jones's murder, having already been acquitted. With Kinney in Mexican custody, she missed her fourth retrial for the murder of her husband, resulting in an arrest warrant. Convicted of Ordonez's murder on October 18, 1965, Kinney was nicknamed La Pistolera, the gunfighter by the Mexican press. Sentenced to 13 years in Iztapalapa Women's Prison, it seemed this would be the end of Kinney's story. But then, on December 7, 1969, Kinney missed a routine evening roll call. When she missed the night's second roll call, her absence was officially noted. An unusual blackout had occurred at the prison around that time and officials took several hours reporting Kinney missing to the police. A wide-scale search for Sharon Kinney was conducted, but she was never located or heard from again. Today, Sharon Kinney holds the longest outstanding arrest warrant for a murder in the history of Kansas City, Missouri, one of the longest outstanding felony warrants in American history as well, and we have no idea where she is or if she's even dead or alive. Ghosts and spirits are usually the subject of campfire tales and horror movies, but occasionally the legal system hears cases involving real-world hauntings. Obviously, modern courts are not equipped to answer the question of whether or not ghosts are legally considered real, but a large portion of people believe ghosts do indeed exist, about 40% of the population according to USA Today. A belief in ghosts can cause plenty of real-world problems, legally. The undead have been involved in several court cases in the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, spanning everything from real estate disputes to trespassing to copyright infringement. In 2005, the landlords who operated the historic Church Street Station, train station, and entertainment complex in Orlando, Florida, filed a $2.6 million lawsuit against two restaurant owners who refused to move into the property after learning that it was allegedly haunted. According to the lawyers for one of the restaurateurs, the owners were Jehovah's Witnesses, whose religious beliefs prevented them from having any contact with undead spirits. When the landlords offered to perform an exorcism, the restaurateurs declined on the grounds that exorcisms are a Roman Catholic religious rite not compatible with their beliefs. According to one of the landlords' attorneys, I asked them if they were good ghosts or bad ghosts, or if they were good ghosts, why it was a problem. Local news sources did not report on a financial statement or other resolution for the suit. The Church Street Station is a well-known attraction for ghost aficionados and it's a popular tourist spot for ghost tours. In 1917, two psychic mediums, Emily Grant Hutchings and Lola V. Hayes, published a book that they said was written posthumously by Mark Twain, who had died seven years earlier. According to the mediums, the novel, which was titled Jap Heron, was written by Twain's ghost, and the mediums spent two years transcribing it through a Ouija board. The story is set in a small Missouri town and follows the eponymous Jap Heron, a young man born into poverty who becomes wealthy with the help of an affluent couple. 
Twain and Hutchings had actually corresponded 15 years before the book was published. In one of his letters, Twain made a note to himself that read, Idiot! Must preserve! At the time, publishing books that were supposedly written by ghosts was a relatively common phenomenon. A New York Times review of the novel noted three similar books had come to print recently. However, the year after the book was published, Twain's daughter, Clara Clemens, sued Hutchings and Hayes to prevent the book from being published. The two authors agreed to cease publication and destroy all existing copies. In the early 1990s, two New York City real estate developers named Jeffrey and Patrice Stambowski purchased a home in Nyack, New York, that belonged to Helen Ackley. The Stambovskis were unaware the house had a long reputation for being haunted, despite the fact Ackley had published accounts of the ghostly occurrences three times between 1977 and 1989, including once in Reader's Digest. According to Ackley, the house was inhabited by three ghosts, a naval lieutenant from the American Revolutionary War and a couple from the 19th century. But Ackley never told the Stambovskis about the hauntings. When they discovered the house's history, the Stambovskis sued Ackley for fraudulent misrepresentation and asked for the contract to be rescinded. In 1991, the New York Supreme Court heard an appeal of the case. The court ruled that Ackley was not liable for damages but also decided that because a haunting can't be determined by a home inspection, the Stambovskis didn't have to honor the contract either. The case, Stambovsky v. Ackley, came to be known as the Ghostbusters ruling. It established the precedent that if a house had been advertised as haunted, regardless of whether or not it actually was, it's legally considered to be haunted. In late 2009, an Ohio court heard a case involving the Staley Mill Farm, which is located near Dayton, Ohio. According to local legends, years earlier the farm's owner, one old man Staley, murdered his entire household, including his family, servants, and himself, with an axe. The story was written up in a book called Weird Ohio. In the book, the authors claimed motorists driving down the nearby Staley Road had experienced unseen forces, which caused them to lose control of their vehicle and swerve. The lawsuit accused the book's authors of inspiring curious tourists to trespass on the property looking for ghosts. The court ultimately dismissed the lawsuit, noting Weird Ohio included a disclaimer warning that many of the locations described in its pages were located on private property and that visiting them amounted to trespassing. Sometimes ghosts can even become involved in copyright disputes. In 2016, Gerald Brittle, author of the 1980 book The Demonologist, which details the case files of legendary paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, sued Warner Brothers for $900 million over the Conjuring franchise. According to Brittle's lawsuit, when he signed an agreement with Lorraine in 1978 to write The Demonologist, it included an exclusive no-compete clause that forbade anyone from making derivative works based on the Warrens' cases without Brittle's approval. Brittle's lawsuit also claimed that when he sent Warner Brothers a cease and desist letter, the company responded that it was basing the movie not on the demonologist but on historical events. Brittle's lawsuit then challenged Warner Brothers to either prove the hauntings and the demonologist had really happened or fork over nearly a billion dollars. A year after the lawsuit, Warner Brothers settled with Brittle rather than attempting to prove the hauntings in the Warren case files really happened. In 2012, a couple in Toms River, New Jersey, Jose Chinchilla and his fiance Michelle Callan, sued their landlord for $2,500 because their new apartment was allegedly haunted. The couple vacated their new home just a week after moving in because they allegedly experienced several strange phenomena, like unexplained footsteps, flickering lights, and doors slamming. The couple and their landlord, a dentist named Richard Lopez, agreed to take their case on the People's Court TV show. Ultimately, Judge Marilyn Million ruled in favor of the defendant, ruling that it was beyond the purview of the court to determine if an apartment is haunted. The judge ordered the plaintiffs to pay the defendant $750 for breaking the lease. In the 1895 Nebraska case, McClary v. Stull, a woman's children sued their mother claiming she wrote a will for her deceased husband's estate with the input of her husband's ghost specifically that she had communicated with her husband's ghost with the use of a planchette, a wooden board with wheels that's used in conjunction with a Ouija board. 
In the end, the Nebraska Supreme Court declined to rule on whether the ghosts are real or not, but did say that ghosts cannot affect court cases. The ruling stated, law it is said is of the earth, earthy, and that spirit wills are too celestial for cognizance by earthly tribunals, a proposition readily conceded, and yet the courts have not assumed to deny to spirits of the departed the privilege of holding communion with those of their friends who are still in the flesh, so long as they do not interfere with vested rights or by the means of undue influence seek to prejudice the interests of persons still within our jurisdiction. The 1919 case, Burchill v. Hermsmeyer in Fort Worth, Texas, originated when an investor named H. C. Hermsmeyer gave Bell M. Burchill, owner of the Fort Worth Oil Development Company, $10,000. Hermsmeyer made the investment based on Burchill's claim that ghosts told her via a psychic medium that oil was located underneath her land. When no oil was discovered, Hermsmeyer took Burchill to court to try and recoup his investment. The court originally ruled in favor of Hermsmeyer, but a 1924 appeal reversed the ruling declaring the existence of ghosts is a matter of belief, not fact. Therefore, the existence of oil in valuable quantities beneath the land in question could not form a basis for relief for the plaintiff. In 1910, a Texas court ruled on a dispute between a man called Alexander and another man named Jim Nurse, who claimed to be a spiritual medium. A year before the case, Alexander had hired a worker to dig a new foundation for his house. After Alexander's wife heard strange tapping sounds, Alexander and his wife believed that a ghost was trying to tell them money was buried on the property. Jim Nurse then claimed that he could help Alexander locate the money in exchange for 20 bucks. With Jim Nurse's help, Alexander was able to find $42 buried in a can, and Alexander gave Nurse the $20. According to the lawsuit, later that night, Nurse stole the remainder of the money. Alexander later accused Nurse of swindling him, but since Nurse actually had found money, the court ruled in Nurse's favor. And finally, in 1876, a Florida woman named E. G. Magruder approached a dying man named John Roberts and claimed that she could cure his illness by conjuring spirits and reciting incantations. Robert gave Magruder a promissory note worth $250, but died a few weeks later. In 1883, attorneys for Roberts sued Magruder, claiming that she extorted the note from Roberts, who allegedly made the agreement when he was not of sound body or mind. Magruder's attorneys argued Roberts was fully aware of the nature of her claims and had not been extorted. The court originally ruled in Magruder's favor, but reversed the decision on appeal. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. When the Catholic Church Goes Ghost Hunting was written by Mariel Loveland for a ranker. The Anguish of Archer Avenue is by Sabrina Ithal for a graveyard shift. The American Murderess Who Disappeared in 1969 was written by Neil Patemore for All That's Interesting. The Bengal Boy with Two Heads was written by Kashik Patauri for Amusing Planet. Court Cases Involving Ghosts was by Jim Rowley for a graveyard shift. The Maiden of Olive and Lena Castle was posted at Moon Mausoleum, and The Encounters of Julie was written by Marcus Louth for UFO Insight. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 15 – Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. 
And a final thought, what seems too difficult for us is a sure sign that it belongs to God. Marie Dupree I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Buried alive inside the castle walls, the Finnish maiden immured still haunts this medieval building of Olavin, Olavinlina. Olavinlina? Olaf? Olaf? Olavinlina? Olavinlina. 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 All right. Buried alive inside the castle walls, the Finnish maiden immured still haunts the med- still haunts a medieval building of the Finnish maiden immured still haunts the medieval building of Olavinlina immured still haunts the medieval building of Olavinlina Olavin Olavinlina buried alive inside the castle walls the Finnish maiden immured the Finnish maiden immured still haunts a medieval building Olavinlina Olavinlina Olavinlina. Finnish maiden immured still haunts the medieval building Olavinlina. Finnish maiden immured still haunts the medieval. The Finnish maiden immured still haunts the medieval building of Olavinlina. Olavinlina for crying out loud. The Finnish maiden immured still haunts the medieval building of Olavinlina. Ova. <laughs> Olavin, not oval. Olavin. Olivin Lena, Olivin. It's Olaf. There is no longer a Rowan tree in the Olivin Lena courtyard, and it's a courtyard, and it's his historical courtyard, and it's historical exist <laughs> existence, historical existence. That's not hard to say, Darren. Hey, weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel, and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.